Well, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate having this opportunity to talk to you, and we want to make this very informal. So if you have any questions and, or suggestions, in fact, that's part of our objective to be here today is to solicit your, your suggestions and also gain from much of your experience. And we have some people who have had prior experience managing uh, this program, so it, it's really important for us to learn from those experiences. Um, what we want to do today is just talk a little bit about Sirtle. Okay? Um, it almost sounds like a very self-assured turtle, Sirtle. Okay? Um, and what this is is this Center for the Integration of Research, Teaching, and Learning. Um, and this is a network. Okay? This is a network of many universities. And it's a real big opportunity, I believe, for uh, science, teaching, uh, and learning on, on campus. So I want to talk a little bit about that um, and introduce uh, what CERTL is. Maybe it's a reintroduction, Angela, about, about CERTL um, as we go along. Now, I have to manage two clickers, so that's going to be very, very interesting. Okay, so the reason why CERTL came about was the issue about the problems associated with STEM um, preparation. Um, so as we are aware, and I, I don't want to get in somebody's way. I'm, can you guys see? Um, as you're aware, there's a, a big need for STEM training in our workforce. There's also um, a lot of uh, attrition in the undergraduate STEM programs. Um, and most of the, the, the faculty who are going to be in research, um, they're also going to be involved in teaching. And most of our training is in the research area, but we don't do as much in the teaching area. And so this is there's really a lack there of, of that kind of preparation. And then oftentimes, um, it didn't take me very much time to find a picture of bored students. <laughs> I mean, this could have been from my class, I think. Um, but Many students, undergraduate students, perceive that, that STEM education is very dry and uh, uh, boring. And so how can we make it more interesting and also engage uh, students in, in STEM uh, areas? By the way, I, I, I concluded what STEM means. Okay, so on that last slide, for those of you who don't know what that is, I have that in there. Um, and that actually is an interesting thing to talk about uh, a little bit is what do we mean by STEM? How broad are we going to have this definition? And I think we're taking, Tracy, correct me if I'm wrong, we're going to take a fairly broad definition of what STEM uh, fields are. Is that what you? Yeah, when, you, when we talk to the folks at CERTL, they're, they're, they have a very broad definition, even on the science end, that, that as the science includes social sciences as well. And so. Um, that's, that's in line with, with, you see NSF in the corner there, which right. is part of their funding. So um, we're going to take a pretty broad swath that what we mean by STEM here. <clears throat> okay. So the mission of this center, which has received uh, National Science Foundation funding, is to enhance undergraduate education uh, through the development of well-prepared STEM faculty uh, in this area of um, teaching and learning practices. So they're going to be prepared to train those undergraduates when, after they go through their graduate program. Okay, so that was, that's the real mission of this whole center and the network that, that's out there. Let me just, this is my history of CERTL that I've sort of pieced together. Please correct me, Angela, as I go along. Um, my understanding that it was established in fall 2006. Okay, there was a call. Um, NSF had the Center for Learning and Teaching in Higher Education. So they were trying to promote this concept. Um, in 2011, this whole network was expanded to about 23 research universities. I think we were a part of the founding, right, Angela? No, no we, we weren't. We actually joined in the expansion in 2011. 
Okay, so we, we joined in the expansion in 2011, and this has, uh, in the process right now, it's about 4,000 future STEM faculty being trained each year through this program. Most of the funding has been coming from the National Science Foundation, but it's been also coming from a group called the Great Lakes Higher Education Guarantee Corporation and the Alfred Sloan Foundation. Okay, so the budget's about, I think it's varied over time, right, Tracy, between 1.3 to 2.5 million um, per year in, in their annual budget. Okay, there is some question what happens like after 2017, 2018, in terms of NSF uh, funding. Okay, so whether that's going to continue on, no one knows. And how they're going to make up, you know, the difference there is a question mark. And part of the, 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 the strategy here was to really engage research universities who train most of these STEM faculty. So there's about 100 doctoral research universities that train about 80% of the STEM PhDs. Okay, and that has big influence on all the other universities, what these, what these faculty do. So if you can get all of those universities involved, then you really can have a big impact on, on STEM uh, education. So that's part of the, been the strategy um, that's been going on. Any questions, by the way? I don't also want to discourage pizza eating, <laughs> you know, so please make sure that, right, <clears throat> don't, don't stop because of me. Yeah, question. When you say 4,000 future STEM faculty, that's 4,000 potential future STEM faculty. That's right, potential. Is there any data at this point on how many, what proportion of people that are in the social program want to become faculty? I'm sure there is. Do you know, Tracy? Oh, okay. I, but I don't know that. We could find that out if you're interested in that. Um, I'm sure there is some data on that. Because as what you would expect, there has to be some evaluation, and we're part, going to be part of that evaluation procedure. And that's the bottom line, right? Exactly what happens there. So this is the network in 2015. And what's happening now is there are 25 new institutions that are joining. So there'll be about 50 institutions, uh, PhD granting institutions. <clears throat> so we were part of uh, CERTL at one point. So we're, gonna, we're, not, we're not really considered a new institution. I guess we would be a recycled institution. I don't know what we're doing. But we are going to be, we have uh, our status currently is we've applied for membership, we have been accepted for membership, and starting in August, once we pay our dues, okay, sort of like a gym membership, you can't get in until you pay the dues, um, that's really when we're going to be starting. But we're seeing our, this is really part of our starting, okay, because what we want to do is engage everyone, get suggestions and ideas in. No. We voted off the island. It was part of a reality series. And we <laughs> that's what happened. No, no uh, essentially what happened is we were taken in when George Justice was the dean of the graduate school. And um, then shortly after, at the time that, uh, that George left and knew, we were also in the position of not having a chancellor, not having a provost and all sorts of things. So it was very difficult for the then interim dean of the graduate school to know exactly what George had in mind and how he was dealing with the money. And it was hard to keep going with some of the things we were doing. At the same time, uh, when we then got a chancellor, they got rid of the graduate school, and so that caused some disruption too. So it was basically that it wasn't clear at that time that we could commit to the dues and the necessary funding on campus in order to keep it going. <laughs> we could try and sneak in. I don't know. <laughs> that, that. So, um, 
And, and, and by having more of these numbers. I think then the appropriate term is a delinquent. There we go. I like that. <laughs> we were trying to set an example. <laughs> and, but actually, this is kind of you know, nice, because then we're going to have about 50. And of course, the impact is going to be greater. So we're joining, rejoining at a, at a really pretty good time, I think, to be honest. Okay, so there's some core ideas of this network, and the main three is teaching is research, le learning communities, and then learning through diversity. And so there are activities and goals associated with each of these areas. Okay, and of course, many of you are engaged already in these types of activities. But just imagine now, that you can also be part of work with your colleagues, a network, so that you know you do some kind of training or a, a, a short course or something of like that. You can bring in other people who are dealing with the same issues, and so that makes it very valuable, I believe. My opinion. Okay, so these are the core areas involved in survey, okay? And what's, what do you get for that membership, okay? Not only do you have a spa, no, you don't have a spa, but you have a lots of activities that are going on that we want to take advantage of, all right? So I already mentioned there are courses in, in different types, online courses, short courses, meetings that are going on. Uh, some of these are MOOCs as well. Does anyone know what a MOOC is? Do we have a MOOC on campus? We have actually talked about that. Okay, these are these massive enrollment courses. Okay, so they have MOOCs. And one of our objectives is to prepare a MOOC okay, as part of our activity. All right. So we're really going to be pioneering, at least for the University of Missouri, and probably putting a tremendous strain <laughs> on our resources, <laughs> trying to figure all of this out. At least it's a strain on me to figure all of that out. But there are also workshops. There's something called the CERTL CAST. I'm going to show you some examples of all of this. There's teaching as research capstone series. You know, so this is engaging graduate students, faculty postdoctoral fellow. There's the MOOC. Okay, there's MOOCs. There are CERTL read journal clubs. There's a network exchange program and topical online discussion groups. Okay, and part of the way you get to that is through this website. Okay, through this CERTL, www.certl.net. So I really encourage you to, and some of you are probably already doing that, right? You're already looking at www.certl.net, right? So we could, we could do these short courses if we wanted to, or do we mm -hmm. have to wait until we're going to do the so, Some of the stuff's open. I mean, it. So we give priority to the members. So if it has a cap on enrollment, then you get them out. But you can do them anyway. You don't have to be members to do that. But some of the, the courses fill up right now. I think it's all together. It's all so the together. topics are really focused on as a, as a group okay. with these, with those missions in mind, you know, those major objectives. Okay. So they'll be grouped by that, whether it's dealing with, you know, teaching is research, which they, the acronym is TAR. I like that. Or if it's, you know, diversity or if it's uh, learning communities. Okay, so th these will all be grouped together. I'll show you how you, how you kind of get into this and find out, for example, if you're interested in a specific area, how do you navigate into that? Okay. It's interesting, when I give students a break in my class, you know, the, the board students, I give them a break. So what would you think they would do when you give them a break? 
They checked the phone. I would thought they would have gotten up and stretched and everything, but they checked the phone. You know, so, so you're probably checking that www.certle.net. Okay, so this is how we would get into using this. This is the way to get into these various areas that they have. Okay, so you would select these, and under these will be all the different activities that are going on. And so this is ongoing. Every month, every day, there's something going on. Okay? And there's a calendar which shows all these events when they're happening. All right? So it's quite dynamic. And, of course, because we're dealing with 50 institutions which are required to contribute, they are all uh, involved and there's all sorts of things going on. You know, have you ever been to one of these meetings where it's like a three-ring circus and you feel like you're missing something? That's kind of what's going on in here, right? So that's why it's so important that we get all this information out to graduate students and faculty and postdocs so they're aware that they can take advantage of this. We will talk about that, yes. There's all sorts of distinctions that you will achieve. And of course, that's something you then take to your employer and say, I am now, you know, the grand poobah of Sertle. No, it's not the name of it. It's a different name, okay? So they have different distinctions depending on how much you have in, been engaged in these Sertle activities, okay? We'll, we'll, yeah. Is there a, when you sign on, is there a, you tell them you're a mem part of a member university, you have a password? Or something? Yes, you have a login here, which it, it gives you additional access. Okay, so you can come in this and just browse. But when you log in, you're a member of the VIP program. I don't exactly know all that. Angela probably knows more about what happens. Yeah, I mean, basically, it, 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 <coughs> your, mem your login includes information about your affiliation, and your affiliation gives you access to certain things that you wouldn't have access to, or priority if you're kind of post course or something. So it's kind of attached right. to your login. Okay, so that's, so there's an advantage of our membership in that regard. <coughs> this just giving you an idea of currently, what are some of the cross-network courses that are being offered? So I mentioned those courses that are there. Now I don't know which one to use. Okay, this one. Uh, so we have, uh, in spring here, 2016, we have something called the College Classroom. And of course, if I, I selected this, it, it has the whole syllabus and and most of, a lot of these involve uh, people from various universities. So it's not just one university. Okay, so they'll all be engaged and, and involved in the teaching. So you get really different opinions and different perspectives depending on what the university is. Uh, there's one here called the Research Mentor Training and then Teaching as Research. So these are all courses that you can take during this period of time, spring. 2016. Okay. Anyone going to sign up? Do they have set start dates, or is it? Kind of yeah, I believe these do have. Set, it says here, you know, what the meeting date. Can't you read that? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, 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 this is one of the things you shouldn't do in presentations. <laughs> I have all this little type in there, but yes, they do have set dates. And stuff. Right. But a lot of them have synchronous time, so yeah. even though they're online, they're not just whenever you want to do them. Right. They actually have synchronous time. Yeah, they have synchronous and asynchronous, I believe. Yeah, they have both. Synchronous. You know, you can have in there. It'll list. I mean, you'll see there. It says the meeting times and it lists. So. Yeah, it has the meeting times, meeting dates, who the instructors are, what universities they're associated with. So are these necessarily? Yeah, it's the main focus is for the graduate students, yeah. right, postdocs. and postdocs, and postdocs, too. Okay. That's the main. But it's open. Yeah, so it would be open. You, you want to take it? Go ahead. You are hoping that we are going to go out and, and encourage our graduate students um, mm -hmm. to, to do Exactly. And also, you know, and I've got a two-pronged two idea here. It's not only for you to get your, encourage your graduate students to do it, but you be involved 
in to putting together one of these forces. Okay? Because as we mentioned, you can have this tremendous impact uh, by doing this. Just think about it, 50 times whatever the graduate populations in these, if they all are taking the course. <laughs> I mean, you would have a big impact. Okay, so, and of course, then, you know, you're developing a course with a colleague and, you know, there's a lot of networking going on. Uh, that, I think, is very valuable for faculty. You know, and there's nothing against you. I do want to network with you, but I also want to network outside, you know, and so that I think there's an advantage of that. These are these shorter, <coughs> they're called surtle casts. And these are shorter, um, basically, meetings, workshops. Okay, and you can see here, oh, you can't see. It's like when they have the equations, you know, and it's, it's, it's obvious. <laughs> but there are quite a few different of these casts that are going on over the course of this uh, spring. And um, again, the themes are all related to those main themes that Sertle is trying to achieve. Okay. So you'll see that all through here. I just wanted to give you an example because this seems like, okay, they're just having this sort of casual meeting. Okay. I just took one of these then and um, looked to see what this is. Here's one on effective and inclusive research mentoring. Okay. So it's not just one meeting, folks. This is a whole series of meetings. And look at all the different universities that are involved in this. So you, there's a lot of material here that students will be able to access and engage in uh, if they're interested in this area. Okay. Handling tricky mentoring situations. Has anyone ever had that? <laughs> so these are, you know, I never had any training in that, right? Did anyone ever have training? Did you have that training? <laughs> you know, I never had any training that this would be so invaluable to get. Oh my God, what did I just say? <laughs> I mean, what is, you know, just think of all the different <laughs> situations, you know, and so it's really, I think, quite useful uh, to get that kind of. Uh, training prior to sort of landing into a, a situation, right? I don't know, do, Angela, do you have some experience so with students who engage this? We actually developed a circle cast series mm -hmm. uh, that was on inclusive design for learning. And, um, yeah, it was I mean, very, yeah. very popular. <laughs> they still talk about it, by the way. Um, it was popular amongst the grown-ups, for the better way of putting it. Mm -hmm. um, the problem was that, again, this was partly where the expansion thing was, they were still like, they'd gone from having eight members to having 20 plus. So we were having a problem getting that many people coming to synchronous time frame. So we were actually looking at new ways of doing it at the time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, it was, you know, coming up with a series of things that was not quite a full course, but, and it was almost more like doing a TED talk kind of thing, um, but through like Black Ball Father. And it worked pretty well. Good, yeah. I think that's the main platform, by the way, for this. Blackboard, Blackboard Collaborate. Blackboard Collaborate. Yeah, I think almost all of them are being run that way. Now, that might put a big strain on Blackboard. <laughs> Who knows? So why, why, why is this important? Uh, what would be the benefits? Well, we hope after students engage in this, they're going to be more effective teachers throughout their careers, which is going to have an impact, of course, on multiple impact. In many cases, you know, you talked about that certification. This is a competitive advantage for our students who go out and compete for jobs. I can say I've been part of this. I have uh, achieved this uh, level of certification, and this is going to help them uh, get those positions. And then, uh, there are a lot of competitive types of uh, programs in which they'll be more successful. I know, I know if I were in a review panel and I saw this, I would, I would actually be quite favorable for that. Is there any uh, career guidance kind of built into the website or the network that you wanted to get on for an SF fellowship? 
there, there is some of this in this, uh, I believe, in this sort of cast and the, the, you know, so helping people understand all these different opportunities. Now, you know, here's, here's the perfect thing. You've just come up with an idea that we as MU could, could lead. You know, for, and if this, is a, if this is an area where students really like to have some training, we should do it. Right. So, yeah, it, this is targeted for post K twelve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. that's the primary yes. target. So it's not that it's, it's not the same. I mean, we want to. I agree with you entirely, but this yeah. is, it seems to me it's targeted for a different. It is, but what I'm saying is I'm not saying that you redesign all the courses and everything to your teaching and how to be good secondary teachers. No, that, that would be done in another place. But there's clear guidance so that if someone at the end of they've done the circle. Yes. Also, I'd say for international students who mm -hmm. want to stay in this country, or even if they want to go back home to their native country and teach, which most international students, if they go back, is what they're going to be doing most of the time. Right. If we don't effectively train them in teaching when they're getting their PhD in a research intensive university. I, I would dispute a little bit about you know the. Uh, the research, uh, you know, the upper level research universities not caring about teaching. Because I, I think uh, in many cases that is a, it is a part of the assessment of this. In almost every, in not in all cases, but almost all of them have split appointments. In fact, I was just looking at the new, um, new policy and it basically says the expectation is even if you have a heavily if you even have anything in terms of teaching, that you're going to be, you're going to be teaching a course. Oh, it's not. I'm not 
I you know, so. Not that expectation, but I'd say 90% of the search committees that I've served on over the 40 years of my career in research intensive universities looking for faculty, it is almost entirely the search training that was counted. Yeah, I agree. Uh, does uh, CERTL advocate uh, teaching appointments? teaching professorships and research departments? I'm not sure it is advocating that. I don't know if it has an advocacy for that. No, but I, I, I would say that I agree. Good, good teaching isn't going to replace mediocre researching. <laughs> you know, and that's not the goal of this is to say, well, I'm an excellent teacher. You need to look over my, look beyond my shortcomings as a researcher. Uh, I, I think you're right. You, you ultimately have to have the research chops there. But what this does do is get value added and uh, to the to those research graduate students and postdocs who do have the research chops that it helps set them apart from perhaps other candidates who also have equally as good research chops. Well, as I said, though, there are a lot of positions in non-research very good and important positions on any liberal arts school Sounds like you're setting this up as a bit of a binary view of the world thing. I mean, wouldn't it be great if every faculty member hired at a research intensive institution would have some training in how to teach in a day to teach? But that's changing the world. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would, I would contend, though, you know, if you look at for a young faculty member, no, one of their early opportunities is a career grant. And what does that require? It requires not only a very sound research uh, proposal, but it also requires a sound teaching proposal. I, I, I had a career grant that was entirely <laughs> That's that not going to fly anymore, though. Yeah. That was, but that was 40 years ago. Yeah. I, would still, I would say it is still based upon the evaluations of the, the, what I know. The teaching is important. Yeah, and, and most, most of the people applying for these have excellent research backgrounds. So their research proposal is excellent, but the teaching part of it is no good. It's but not innovative, it's not interesting, because they're doing the same old, same old. And that's where I think a lot of the newer ones, and maybe a different story. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that this isn't going to count for the faculty, or the student, the potential faculty who want to go to research intensive universities if they're willing to spend the time to do it. But where I think it really can count big time is for the prospective faculty that want to go to the liberal arts colleges, the you know, community colleges, three-year schools, those that are not so research intensive. And we really need to have good faculty, sure. good teaching faculty. So too, there's nothing sure. wrong. No, but I mean, there are gaps as well in these big research universities in terms of STEM teaching. Yeah. You know, so that maybe that's something to be aware of. Anyway, let's, let's move on because I, I wanted to provide some opportunities for, for example, to, for Amy to talk a little bit about. Um, well, and, and this is basically following the same thing we were just talking about in terms of the benefits. It, we're, we're trying to engage not only the graduate students, but also faculty and postdoctoral fellows. So we're going to see these benefits in terms of their marketability and, and um, 
in a, their effective teaching and learning. So this is where we see you know, that MU will also have some benefits. And of course, there's a lot going on at MU right now, right? There's a lot of this kind of activity that's going on. And we can't just say, OK, now CERTL is coming in to replace everything. So what we want to do is sort of complement and work with these programs that are going on. And of course, one of the ones that's very important is, is this forum right here is trying to uh, have that space and those conversations about science teaching. So this is a really important part of that. Probably why one of the reasons why we got the award, even though we had, you know, we were recycled. Who knows? Okay. So there's a lot going on, uh, and Tracy could probably talk a lot about all these programs if, yeah, if, if the, the, only thing, in, the only thing I'll say just for the sake of time is is uh, when, when Peter and I were putting together this pro proposal, the thing that we kept talking about was trying to find spaces and places that pull together all the pieces that are going on on campus together um, so that when people were thinking, um, and, and, and this is in lieu, and, and Dana and I were talking about the, 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 the teaching and learning center that it that is or was or, you know, maybe it will be, may not be, we don't know <laughs> at this point. Um, um, but having that space and place on campus where we were pulling together these pieces um, so that people knew and faculty advocates and postdocs all knew that there was, you know, I want to learn, about, I want to know more about teaching and learning. Oh, I'm going to look at CERTL and see all the different opportunities that are not just going on on the website that Peter kind of talked through, but also what's going on here on campus that's, that's happening as well. Right. So they take courses in college, which is poetry, and then like their college teaching is like the students in the tradition. Yep. Yes. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Yes, we will. Okay, so again, man, there are lots going on. Uh, many of you are involved in that. Now, I wanted to mention the MU Campus Writing Program. Amy is, of course, the director of the Campus Writing Program. And part of where I am going to be uh, focusing on is uh, teaching how to teach, teach how to teach science writing. Okay, and I'm, that's one area I'm very interested in, so more effective science writing. So we want to develop a, a MOOC about that. And so we want to work with the campus writing program. And so it's, it's important to be aware of what you're already doing. And um, anything you want to comment about this? Um, you may be familiar that the writing program is, of course, what supports the writing intensive courses for the undergraduates here at the university. Um, but we do an awful lot as well to support faculty um, one of the things in the professional development, um, many of you in here have attended and have seen our workshops that we have offered um, students year round. Uh, so helping you think about assignment design, assessment of writing. Um, but we've also been partnering with some faculty to do some of that scholarship of teaching and learning. Where someone has a question about how do I look at what my students are doing in their writing assignment so that I can do a better job than in assigning and teaching writing. And so we've worked with faculty on gathering some data, looking at student writing, um, assessing that writing together, doing some interviews, doing some surveys. So students are going to kind of excited to look at some of what's been going on in writing intensive courses. So that kind of model is something, too, that we would be happy to support faculty or graduate students. Um, we also see that, yes, we're undergraduate, but in order to offer the kind of teaching for the 400 courses that are writing intensive, we have a lot of graduate students who are also involved. So it becomes kind of a natural mentoring pathway for people who are at the, you know, working as a graduate teaching assistant in a writing intensive course. They're getting support from the faculty that they're working with. They're getting support from the campus writing program, again, for the teaching of that writing. Um, so we see this as a natural place to, for a fertile kind of approach um, to support people, both, um, both faculty members and graduate students. But there's another piece to this, and that is something that we all share, and that is we're writers. And we have to be, as, as Peter said, not only teaching writing and supporting science writing, but, but how are we doing with our own writing? And so everything from offering writing retreats, and even though they're retreats, it may sound like they're on a spa, that's not what it is. It's come to a place where we're not going to bother you, and you're going to sit and write. And we, um, last year, 
We think we have 34 publications as a result of last year's writing retreat. People submitted. Um, so we're seeing that that time, that dedicated time, has been really good. We've hired some professional editors that come on board as well a couple times during the year to work with faculty and graduate students and postdocs. So we have specific retreats that people are signing up for. So there's a lot going on in campus writing. So um, we also have launched a teaching with writing website. So the screenshot of that is from the campus writing program, but the URL is from our teaching with writing page. And we will do an official launch um, of that website here probably in the next couple of weeks. Um, but you can still get there now, it is live. But that is where you will see examples of some of our faculty who have been working on some really interesting projects. So we, um, and we've got definitely Cynthia is represented on that website. So that's basic. Anything I could elaborate on? There was a lot to throw at you. The yes. <laughs> <laughs> Deanna Langford and I are, are partners in crime for that. Um, we have an improving future quality grant. So I've mentioned a little bit to you about it, Bill. It's still in its pilot year. Um, it's in the, um, out of the Department of Higher Education, working with um, middle and high school math and science teachers across Missouri. So we have 22 teachers who are involved this year. We will expand that to 50 next year. Our leadership team is made up of representatives, math and science, educators from um, six different institutions across Missouri. Um, so it's designed, again, to support math and science teachers, especially at tiny schools. So we have some of our teachers who they are in the science department, or they are the math department at their school. And so how can we support them? So Deanna goes and works with teachers at the school, provides one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Um, so I'd be happy to also share more about that. Yeah, you and I need to meet And I know when I sort of started, I was looking at the landscape of University of Missouri and where I could make my mark on teaching. And this is where I went, the campus writing program. And so it was very important for me to start my teaching research with support of many of the people who were there. And so that provided me with some, at least a start. And, and so it's, it's important to realize where these centers of excellence are on campus and how we, you know, as a teacher and, and be able to utilize those. And of course also the technological you know, innovation. That's also been a big part of our, our programs. Okay, um, now, so what is the proposed, uh, what have we proposed in terms of new CERTL programs on for, or activities at MU? So this is what we submitted to the, um, the CERTL network. Well, uh, and these are these various activities like the CERTL roundtables, CERTL speaker series. Notice that this is somewhat aligned with much of what is going on here. So this would be complementing a lot of that, but including this big network of universities as well. And then um, this is where I'm going to be focusing uh, fair amount of my energies, which is this teaching of writing for the sciences, an online course. Okay? Um, so we're going to focus on uh, teaching effective science uh, writing. Is we're going to be. And this is what we put in the proposal, but we're open to changing the mechanisms. So if you have ideas of, and maybe we're being too repetitive on, on maybe certain things that are going on on the campus, uh, if there are other needs, I mean, we'd be very happy to yes. hear your thoughts on right. what those can be. We're yes. not going to, they're not going to pin us down. We had to put some things down when we right. put the proposal together of what we thought made sense given some of the gaps that we thought were in place on campus. But again, we're really open to what those mechanisms could look yes. like. Yeah, creative ideas. And of course, you know, you're hearing from graduate students some of the needs or maybe ones that have in the past, you know, been your graduate student and now they're working and they said, well, gosh, I wish I had some training in X. It would be nice to, you know, if you could give us that information and let us know, you know, in your particular STEM area, what are some of the needs uh, that are there and we can try and, and work on that, okay? And we already mentioned the CAS series, these uh, online uh, presentations, okay? So this is part of what we're proposing. Okay, now, 
we finally get to the outcomes. All right, so these are basically, and I, you know, they call them outcomes. I don't know, I, I would call them like certification. Is that, is that a bad word to call it certification? I don't know why they call it. The, anyway, so basically there are three, uh, three levels. There's the certal associate, the certal practitioner, and then the certal scholar. Which one do you think is better? Scholar is always good, right? <laughs> to be called a scholar. All right, so these are going to be ones that you will need to do different activities, which would include both certal and on-campus uh, uh, activities that you would have to do as a graduate student, okay? And so we have had, we have a proposal here, which we, we put in, and, and you might want to talk about that a little bit, Tracy. Sure, right. this. A, a lot of it is, again, when we put this together, we were trying to find ways to leverage what it is that we're already doing on campus um, and, and put it in a way that's, that, that makes sense. And so you'll see that a lot of the framework for moving from associate to practitioner to scholar is based around the minor in college and um, the minor, the minor probably hasn't had a lot of a attention lately. Right now, we're not getting a lot of students going through and completing the minor. That's not always been the case on campus. Um, I, I do know that the college teaching courses, the various ones on campus, the, the numbers are still pretty good. I, I taught the, the college of ag version uh, of college teaching this last year around for the first time in a while. We have good numbers. Um, I, I think Elpa's, uh, yeah, and, and I know Elpa's college teaching classes also um, have good numbers as well. So we, there's a base there. We just, we're hoping maybe to use this as a vehicle to help the minor and vice versa. Uh, because again, how, trying to find ways to give our graduate students, um, the graduate students can complete the minor, the postdocs can't, unless they want to sign up for classes and, you know, then I, I guess they get 75% off their tuition, but um, <laughs> uh, but this is a way for our postdocs then to also get some kind of recognition for the work that they're doing regarding building their teaching capacity. So, um, like I said, we, we're open to tweaking how this looks. We tried to write it in a way that was very open. So if you didn't want to do the formal coursework, engaging in able conversations and other kinds of uh, maybe uh, non-formal kinds of events would also move you through the system as well. I, you know, I'm a teacher educator by training, and so I, I'm not sure I care how you get the information as long as you get it. And so um, that's kind of the philosophy behind how we put those pieces together, ultimately leading to the point where you are engaging in scholarship of teaching and learning. I'm not hovering, I just, this thing, the camera points where I go, so that's why I'm behind you. Okay, I know, you know, we're kind of getting close to the end, and we did really want to have some time for suggestions and comments. You notice we didn't pass out any tomatoes, so <coughs> you can't throw them at me, but, um, and, you know, if you have any, you know, you may think a little bit about this and, and want to um, send that to me. I don't know. We didn't put our emails down. We should, oh, you have the emails. Yeah, I, I, I could send them out to the, the whole... Yeah, please send, please send that. Because, so if you, you know, in the middle of the night, undergraduates all get emails that are like at 2 or 3 in the morning. You know, they're like night owls or something. You know, so if that, in the middle of the night, you have an idea, please send it to us. Yeah. And that's another thing that could be changed, probably, is that um, the expectation is that they go into an internship, they do some teaching and observation with assigned faculty members, or a, with a, someone who teaches in a discipline. And so um, they're left to find that person. There's no like, network for finding them. And uh, there's not a lot of structure for what they do in the internship, because it could be really helped. Um, and, uh, the mentors also don't have a lot of support for what are what am I supposed to do with this student, right? So 
So I think that we can uh, give a lot of support to the mentors for mental training. Here are some things you can do with a new teacher. Here are some things to help them look for. Here are some things to make sure you have them, you know, getting up and teaching. Here are some smaller activities they can do, things like that to kind of give them more support. Um, and then uh, perhaps there can even be like some kind of a mentor network where the mentors could talk to each other and share their experiences or, you know, things like that. That's a great that's idea. That's wonderful. That, that is an issue. Having been one of the people that was in charge of that credit for Catherine. Oh, yeah. So. <coughs> Other suggestions? I have one. Ideas? Yeah. Well, I have to run away because I have a meeting in five minutes. But okay. So given what's been going on on the campus recently with respect to issues of race and mm -hmm. also things that have been going on nationally to do with sex discrimination, sexual harassment, there's a piece of that we didn't that you didn't concentrate on that's part of what Circle does mm -hmm. that has to do with diversity. It mm -hmm. has to do with how we train for diversity and how we teach to diversity. And I think that there's a big space in there that we could really not only uh, benefit from, but it would be uh, great to be able to show our students that, look, we have these, there are experts on other campus that, campuses that can help us develop this, that we're in a position to do some of these things. So mm -hmm. I'm currently in charge of um, developing the proposal for a campus-wide diversity requirement for the students, but we need to go so much further than that. And this is a space that I think we should explore that. Now I have to run away. Well, that's a great idea, great suggestion. The, the, and, and Tracy, maybe you would answer that. We'll, we'll start sending, when, when we start building the, the website, right now it'll probably be within the Office of Grad Studies website, or the kind of subsection. Once we build that, put the pieces together, um, I'll probably start sending that out to our directors of graduate studies and our graduate contacts to then send out. And then we'll be tweeting, and then we're, we're good about including grad professional counsel. We'll be exceptionally good at tweeting out to the grad student population. And so we'll, we'll start communicating outward once. I, I've been hesitant, I, I follow CERTL. I've been hesitant to push things out from our, our Twitter account because we're not, we're not paying yet and all that good stuff, so. Um, right, if they have questions about the minors, send them to me um, and, and we'll get them Yeah, and, and currently, I mean, the, the, the structure, and it may change, who knows. I'm going to be the sort of faculty institutional leader, and, and Tracy's going to be the administrative uh, leader, coordinator person. So those are the two people. Yeah. So those certifications, I guess, who is those out? Is that the University of Missouri is then giving yes. out the? Yes. Through CERTL. So I just finished my PhD. They call it onboarding. I've never heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> onboarding. So we're going to so be onboarded into this CERTL network. And I'd like to know. I mean, I'd like to know more. So you did CERTL activities. So we might want to pursue a little bit about this and see about you know you getting one of these. Yeah, I think that would be something we want to pursue. Okay. Um, and let me know. We can talk to the CERTL people and, and see what. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, Joe Johnston is that? Oh, we know. <laughs> <laughs>